Hello, everybody, and welcome to another very special summer yes. episode of Ignite Radio Live. You are with Greg and Stephanie Schleter over the five mighty stations of Annunciation Radio for the Almighty, and we are blessed to be together. Join us to go more deeply into this great adventure at, let's proclaim it, I love, love my family. Family. us. And what's at ilovemyfamily.us, Stephanie? So you will find many tools there to help foster a culture in your homes and with your friends of prayer and conversation, talking and praying. Mm-hmm. And that the leads up, the focus, if you will, is to the um, Sunday readings of that next week and just to dive more deeply. But you'll also find there daily questions, fun questions, some prompts to really stir up and teach that language of prayer and talking if you need a little help. But we want you to plan on joining us in September for eight weeks, united with other families of tremendous opportunity on a weekly basis, united to talk and pray in our homes. And that leads into what we're calling Sanctus Eucharistic Family Revival. The Friars of the Renewal are joining us November 3rd and 4th for an amazing regional diocesan-wide experience of the Eucharist and coming alive. So those eight weeks beginning in September lead into that. And I know you're asking, where can I find out more, Greg? I want to get on board right now. So CatholicRevival.us, CatholicRevival.us. And as we are 100% dependent upon your prayers and support, we do ask you to please consider partnering with us. Click on that partner tab. So about a week ago, maybe a, a, somebody out of the blue sent me a very affirming and encouraging email and commented on how looking at LinkedIn, a story that I'd written there, caused him, busy man, a lot going on, a pastor, a priest of a number of years, shared very beautifully how he had a number of common connections, not the least of which were Joe Campo, whom we've had as a guest on our program before, uh, of Grassroots Films and Media, a beloved brother from New York, and to other connections also pertaining to media and trying to make God known through the media and just really conveying his priestly heart. As we interacted over email, I thought, you know what? It just seems like God is appointing a time for us to capture a little bit of him in his life and his story, especially as he told me that he is retri- retiring, or as we might say, trying to retire because he's all in it for the kingdom, but uh, has been pouring his life out for many years. So really, you're with us, first time, brand new, having this conversation, and we very warmly welcome you, Father Dennis Dinan, to our program. How are you doing today, Father? Great, great. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. And uh, uh, there's one part about that LinkedIn that Maybe you didn't mention, and that is I was looking for the address of um, this woman in our parish, and when I hit enter, I wound up on LinkedIn, and I have no idea oh. <laughs> of how that happened. The, the, and your, the Holy Spirit your was working as the s- server, is that what, or search engine? <laughs> sure. So it doesn't like that, but I mean, it's never happened to me before like this. So uh, that's uh, that's why uh, I told Greg, I thought this was not a coincidence. Absolutely. And we're so blessed Mm -hmm. that you said yes to this. Let's start with one of our favorite scriptures that we love to proclaim from Revelation. They defeated the enemy who doesn't see the enemy alive and well in our culture today. They defeated the enemy by the blood of the lamb beautiful, our holy mass as Catholics, Mm. right? And by the word of their testimony. And so we love to give people, especially our special guest, um, a chance to proclaim their testimony. Tell us a little bit about where you are from, where, if you want to share how old you are, but your parents, your family background, anything like that, that you'd like to start with. I'm from Woodside, Queens, New York. And, uh, that's where I was born, and that's where I grew up. And uh, I will be 75 this September, September 29th, of the Archangels. Yes, wow, yes. great feast day. Well, it was only St. Michael when I was born, so uh, uh, <laughs> fascinating. <laughs> that's great. I didn't that know was, that. I'm one of seven children, and, uh, you know, you speak of family and uh, the beauty of family and all that stuff, and that's not my personal experience. Fill that out a little you know, bit as much as you are willing. Well, I'm uh, the second oldest. I'm the oldest boy. And um, my father was the worst alcoholic I've ever known in my life. Mm-hmm. And uh, still to this day. And uh, I don't know what if people understand what it's like to live in a house with, mm-hmm. with an alcoholic. 
I was an honor student all through grammar school. It was amazing. And uh, and then, you know, when I started going through uh, puberty and all that stuff, I started thinking for myself and uh, it's something my father couldn't deal with. Right. When you're in an alcoholic home, you're living in a dictatorship, you know. It, it was tough. So uh, I managed probably from the years when I was 12 to 14 and then, at that point, my father, he, he worked for the New York City Transit Authority, and uh, uh, he had enough time in that he, he was able to win the day shift, hmm. and uh, which was great for him, he said, but I didn't know about for the rest of us. And uh, hmm. my father was very violent, and I, and I was the, the one he was violent with. And so um, the fact that he would be home in the afternoon and then all through the night uh, led to real difficulties and uh uh, got to the point where I could not live in the same house with him. And uh, so uh, I spent much of my time uh, until I went to the Navy on the streets. Let me uh, pause you a second, Father. So you were born roughly in 1948, if my math serves me correctly? Exactly. Okay. Good job, Greg. So 1948, the world was where it was at. It's a post-World War II very fresh out of World War II, so a lot of strife and struggle, questioning of institutions, questioning of authority, and all of that was beginning probably to emerge a little bit. But and for most people, I'd, I suspect post-World War II is kind of a happy time, kind of a come home from the war, let's recover, get back to your homes. But for you, you're describing, you know, in few words, but we get it, deep hurt, deep wounds um, in at the heart of a home, and from a father who is meant to be iconic of the Father in Heaven and the effects that that can have. We've talked about that in the past. So you coming to a consciousness and awareness, if you will, of, of your own life, knowing you need to leave. So I suspect the Navy. So 18, if you don't mind me asking, what was the nature of faith to you in your history and up to this point? What did you think of God as you recall? You know, we went through uh, Catholic school all of our lives and stuff. And uh, when I was 10 years old in the fourth grade, I uh, became an altar server like everybody else. And uh it was a, a wonderful experience. I mean, church is really part of our lives. However, my father would fight like anything, you know, to get us out the door. And then we'd come back from mass and uh, uh, he beat the heck out of me. And uh, it eventually became meaningless, not only to me, but I, I believe to my to my si- siblings also. But, you know, you mentioned the, the post-World War uh, environment and... Uh, I just learned something new a couple of, of years ago, and uh, it was an incredible insight. I saw this man. The first thing he did was start punching. I mean, and he always hit me in my face and uh, mm. very, very difficult to deal with. And I used to defy him also uh, just to uh, uh, because that's who I am. Mm. I said, come on, is that what you got? Come on. Mm. So Scrap the Irishman. And, yeah, yeah. You know, my, my mother fell in love with this guy, and... Um, uh, she passed up a, a screen test out in Hollywood. She was beautiful. Mm. And um, so, and there was something there. And um, he got shipped overseas, went into the war. He was in the Army Air Force. And, uh, you know, a couple of years ago, my brother sent me, you know, some of the history of his squadron. And uh, he won the Distinguished Flying Cross, which is right up there with the, mm-hmm. the Medal of Honor. Mm-hmm. The whole squadron, I think they got three bronze stars also. I mean, this is all for heroism. Mm. He was the flight engineer, but he was the belly gunner on um, the Flying Fortress. Wow. And uh, and so when I put two and two together, this man probably saved the squadron more than one time. Mm. And knowing that there was a, a tender heart mm. inside, when he came home from the war, I don't know how many planes he shot down. I don't know how many people were in them. But I think he saw, you know, these are filled with men, uh, family men, uh, husbands, wives, uh, husbands, children, and uh, just like everybody else. And I don't think he ever was able to talk about it. Mm. But uh, I believe he came back with PTSD, just Mm -hmm. like all these others. And... uh, you know, uh, he was carrying this this conflict and this anger with him, mm. and uh, you know, I think I became the the brunt of that, and uh, you know, I came to an understanding of it, and uh, great sympathy. I mean, I pretty much, I, I pretty much lived on the streets for four years uh, 
Uh, eventually, I got thrown out of Catholic high school and everything. I just couldn't mm. keep up with anything. The crime rate in Woodside at that time was worse than we say worse than Harlem. And uh, mm. when heroin first came into New York, it came came in Bushwick and Astoria, which were on both sides of us, and uh, we were getting killed. Mm. And uh, my friends, I mean, people were being shot, mm. friends of mine, people were ODing. Uh, I know I was sleeping in the hallways with some of these mm. drug addicts, and, uh, you know, that, that was kind of my home. Mm. And uh, Wow. Can I pause you a second? Day, so, Nate, yeah. you're going about to tell a story, but just for our audience... So you were on the streets for about four years. We're talking the 1960s again, if my math is following. You're in your teen years or maybe a little after or something. And just to punctuate also, as you spoke of your father, I don't want to miss this opportunity for our listeners who have maybe dealt with the trauma of a loved one. And there's nothing more tragic than in being inflicted by a parent meant to provide for us and care for us and love us, but you're giving us a keen insight that really resonates with Dr. Bob Schutz, right? His book, Be Healed and Be Transformed, this notion that hurting people hurt people. It's a great insight for us to maybe heal by thinking about those who've hurt us and be mindful that they're really probably acting out, projecting deep wounds and hurts that they have themselves. And there is healing there. So I'm, I'm beginning to sense the anointing of the Spirit as you continue to tell your story. But just for any who are listening right now as Father is sharing this story and maybe share with an alcoholic parent or somebody in a home where you've been wounded or afflicted, just pay attention to that. Let's see how it continues to work out. So continue the story, Father. And you're absolutely right, because I'm a, I'm a Vietnam vet. I went into mm. the Navy. Some of the priests, uh, they, they asked me to give a talk on Veterans Day and stuff mm. like that. And uh, I've given this talk a couple of times, and it has really really touched families and mm. uh, it has given them an insight which they didn't have also. Please keep going. We had the highest crime rate and um, um, stolen cars, you know, drugs, you name it, and uh, theft. Uh, we had alcoholics in almost every uh, every home and uh, and we knew. We delivered the beer and uh, <laughs> we worked for the beer distributors so we were in almost everybody's homes and uh but one day where we hung out, a friend of mine came by in the car and he said, you want to go to a party? And I said, yeah, sure. Come on. I didn't ask any questions. I mean, and um, it was a stolen car. Um, I didn't realize he was dead drunk. And so we got just about where the party was. We turned the corner and he passed out. His foot went flying down wow. the gas. We crashed the car, totaled the car. And <clears throat> I mean, almost immediately we heard the sirens and, uh, we were running for our lives, but mm. uh, they, they caught us and uh, but brought us down to the station in those holding pens and then uh, being uh, interrogated all night. Uh, mm. It wasn't until about four o'clock in the morning somebody mentioned my the, my uncle's name, John Henry. He was a police captain in the next precinct. Wow. And uh, I said, what are you doing with John Henry? And I said, I don't want him to know anything about this. They went back into the conference room and came back out and said, what are you willing to do if we let you walk out of here tonight? I mean, that was grand larceny back in those mm -hmm. days. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I said, I'm going to the Navy. And uh, and that was that was probably a turning point in my life. I was lucky. I was uh, I had a second chance at that point. And uh, the Lord used all of that, huh? Yes. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Yeah. yeah. When I actually got to boot camp, boot camp, we had to do these battery tests and to, to see where they were going to put us. And uh, I remember um, this guy sitting down with me. He said, what do you want to do? And I said, uh, cook. He said, what do you mean, cook? That's great. <laughs> and I said, well, that's what I can do. I mean, that's as far as my uh, future was at, at that point. And uh, uh, I had lost all my drive, everything. I, had, I was knocked down so many times, rejected and uh, just put down. I mean, it, it's tough leaving a home like that mm -hmm. uh, with that state of mind. And uh, so I took the test. And the next day I came back and he said, you're not going to cook. And uh, he said, your tests were too high. So he said, we're sending it out to uh, the Naval Air Force. And mm -hmm. so I was with helicopters for the next four years. Mm -hmm. And I made two cruises, one to Vietnam mm -hmm. and then one to the North Atlantic. And uh, I had several other good assignments, one great, and that was in weapon systems test in Tax River, Maryland. And uh, mm -hmm. we were testing all the armaments, and we had one of every kind of plane and uh, armament that was being used in Vietnam at that time. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
and I was working for Marines down there, which was fabulous. So you have a technical mind. I know a little bit uh, from our interactions through email where some of this is going. So you definitely discovered you have an analytical mind and ability to assess things and uh, able to figure things out quite easily. And the Navy saw that and put you to work. That must have given you a little bit of a value that maybe you didn't necessarily have before. You have the validation of this institution, a noble institution, the Navy. And, uh, and you're finding yourself doing meaningful work. That must have, you know if you will, affirmed your masculinity to some extent. Well, maybe not until uh, that last assignment I told you in in Maryland. Uh, I remember my first weekend, I was able to get back to New York. And uh, a friend of mine, uh, her girlfriend was from Jersey City, was there for the weekend. I just felt madly in love with her. Mm. It was uh, uh, pretty, pretty amazing. She was a person who was able to look at me and see me and, mm-hmm. and build me up. It was pretty amazing. You know, she convinced me to finish high school. She uh, encouraged me. On my last cruise, I, I took my college boards. I, I got into one college. My, <laughs> my transcript was so bad. But I, and I was on probation. That's uh, okay. But, <laughs> you did it. Yeah. But, uh, you know, she was the one who really in, inspired me and... Uh, uh, you know, my, my hopes was that uh, I could use now what I've learned and my education and, and the future so that we could have a, a, a life together, a family and all of that. But uh, uh, her mother convinced her I was going to be a bum and uh, uh, she uh, her boss loved her. He was an account executive uh, down on Wall Street and making 60 grand a year and uh I was struggling still to get through college on a GI Bill, mm. and because uh, I had to, I had to have my own apartment and everything. And uh, but how uh, beautiful that didn't work out. her words, and what a lesson for all of us, right? Words of encouragement, words of affirmation, words. Someone believed in you. Somebody encouraged you, and the impact that that one person had. And the Lord put that love in your heart for her, right? To be open to it and and to oh, yeah, experience yeah. that love in that way, which I'm sure he used to help heal. So beautiful. Mm-hmm. Except the next three years were devastating. Okay. Just trying to do it. Oh. <laughs> Tell us. I mean, Chapter three. I, I, I had a uh, uh, just an a empty hole in my heart. And actually, she called up three years later and... Uh, crying on the phone and uh, she married this guy. He left four kids uh, and his wife for her. And uh-huh. uh, mm-hmm. and then uh, Christmas Day when she was giving birth to her first child with him, uh, he left for another woman. And, uh-huh. Uh, uh-huh. and I said, what the heck are you calling me for? I mean, <laughs> right, right. And she said, well, you're the only one who would understand. So, uh-huh. yeah. So how, how old are you at this point, father? Yeah, 22, 23, yeah. Yeah, I got, out, I, I got out 90 days early from the Navy, and uh, I was able to start college in the uh, uh, spring semester at St. John's University. I still remember my interview. They said, uh, I, I said, how come you took me and nobody else did? And they said, well, you know, your high school trans- transcript was horrible, and uh, but uh, your SATs were so good, we thought... Uh, We'd see how you could do under ideal conditions. And yes. uh, and they wanted me to study computer science. They thought that was the best thing for me. They had just started a program there the year before. So I w- I'm back with the dinosaurs and computers. I mean, <laughs> uh, they didn't have computer science uh, teachers back then. We we studied under electrical engineers, which was a blessing in, in many, many ways for me and uh, in my mm. career. And uh, So this is around, 19, so, around 1970 or so. How are right, they? I graduated in 1971. Okay. No, no, I, mm-hmm. I left the Navy in 1971. Okay. I graduated in 1974. All right. So computer science, and your heart's broken, and the woman calls and kind of affirms at least something f- meaningful of that relationship. Um, keep going in the story. Fascinating. I chose to um, to go full-time days, and then I worked nights. I worked a worked graveyard shift. Uh, it would have been five years to complete my major. So I worked out of the way, and I, I did it in three years and four months. And uh, wow. I didn't want to live like this. And uh, oh, I went summer semesters and everything. And uh, that's amazing. 
some of the, the, the training and uh, the discipline that I had uh, in, in grammar school from the nuns, you know, writing, uh, composition, and all that stuff. Uh, mm. I realized I, I, I was a cut above the others mm. and, uh, who weren't given this kind of education. I was one of the few people who had a, um, who had a goal. You know, I knew why I was there. I was a helicopter mechanic for four years, and I did not want to be that. And uh, I, I, I wanted to work with my mind. The helicopters that uh, uh, Joe Biden and the other presidents, they fly in. Mm -hmm. I was uh, part of what we call the check crew on that. And we used to take one apart and put it back together every single month, wow. whether we were at sea or on land. And uh, so I could probably still do it today. Yeah, that's yeah. fabulous. That's so, Father, in our email interactions, you shared that you were on Wall Street for a number of years. You shared that you were supervising you had trainees, one of whom turned out, shall we say, very prominent and successful in the world, connected to such names as DreamWorks and major animated films, and you definitely were an influence in his life. So um, that's a little bit where the story leads to some extent. So tell us a little bit about that. Where is God in the picture for Father Dennis, the future Father Dennis? When I was... Um Working my way through college, I, I first worked in the bank nights, and uh, I did all of their check processing. And then I worked, for, did the back office work for two uh, brokerage houses. Mm. And there was a group of consultants there, and uh, I got to know them over the years. And when I graduated, they wanted me, and mm. uh, it was amazing. And uh, uh, we had clients maybe... 40 or more clients on Wall Street and the all traders, all trading firms. This is when mini computers first came out and uh, they had 16K, not megabytes, anything, wow. 16K. <laughs> wow. They had no operating systems and we were developing trading systems on uh, for these guys on there and uh, really absolutely amazing. And uh, I, I worked for Genius uh, for, for years there in the company and uh, – uh, he liked me because he never finished the eighth grade, uh, passed the, the eighth wow. grade. And uh, so I was one of the people who didn't intimidate him. And uh, <laughs> now That's great. when I uh, uh, when he was going in to give presentations, I could give him the, uh, the technical terms instead, instead of saying widgets and gadgets and all of that stuff. And uh, it was absolutely amazing. I didn't realize what I learned there until uh, until I left and I, I started working for other companies and. I mean, we literally were developing operating systems there. Mm -hmm. we, we were inventing the wheel back at that point. People were only able to see trading and stuff through the ticker tapes and stuff mm -hmm. like that. And now mm -hmm. we were supplying all this information across their screens and allowing them to trade from that. So, so <clears throat> mid-70s, we're talking up later 70s probably. You went from a difficult home circumstance to the Navy by God's providence and found some great uh, validation in working with your mind and figuring things out and uh, came back and we were able to complete high school, a, a woman in your life who was very influential and encouraging of you. So high school completed and then college St. John's found a way to kind of work your way through that and computer science um, connecting you with some firms and people validating your skill sets uh, that brought you to a place that I imagine was probably not only affirming of you and your gifts, but somewhat lucrative. So I'm going to keep asking the question and maybe there, there's no answer to this but so as the story is unveiling where is god in this how, how are you answering so to speak the big questions what am i meant to do what's my purpose on this earth how is that playing out with the young dennis well i i wasn't dealing with all of that and uh we were having a great time and uh i had so many friends and everything like that we uh, we hung out up in lincoln square uh, uh and uh, up by lincoln center in New York and, uh, you know, playing tennis, squash. We had uh, three ski houses for three years up in Vermont. And uh, nice. uh, um, it was a good life. And uh, the last job I had down on Wall Street was, it was the most prestigious bank down there at the time. And uh, they hired me because of my work in the consulting firm. And they needed somebody who really could uh, deal with mini computers. And uh, they just made a decision. They wanted to go with Hewlett Packard's new brand of mini computers. And uh, and so I started a technical group there. And that's when I started uh, uh, building up a team and all that stuff. So uh, 
there's not only one success story after me. There's there's a, there's a few of them. And uh, tell us, you know, uh, uh, you're in your thirties. Yeah. Things are rolling for you. You're top of the world. But you're at the birthplace of this revolution of of um, computers that are soon to be woven into every aspect of everybody's life to the point of even being in our pockets. So that's really fascinating. And uh, so we can imagine you without the collar on right now. Imagine a 30-year-old blessed to be in that context and kind of one of those making Silicon Valley rise, if you will. So tell us a little more about that. That's fascinating. Actually, I was a part of Silicon Valley. I used to go out there, oh, three or four times every year. I was a member of a think tank out in Hewlett Packard. Part of their marketing department, and uh, uh, I rub, rubbed elbows with a lot of people. Um, one of the times I was out there, uh, Steve Jobs was starting his company, and uh, mm-hmm. somebody asked me if I'd like to meet him, and I said I'd love to, but um, I just asked this young woman to marry me, and uh, 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 I said that's not going to work out. And uh, but I would have been, I think, number three in the company if if I would have joined, and. Uh, mm. uh, of Apple. But, uh, wow, are you kidding yeah. me? It's amazing. No, no. By yeah. the way, I have to ask the question, just a little bit of a side fun. Are you an Apple phone guy or are you an Android phone guy? Or is it just a dumb question because you were connected to Apple back in the day? We have fun little, we have six children and I'm the Let only, oh, I'm going to say I'm the only holdout <laughs> of the Android. I have an issue of taking the Apple, the forbidden fruit from the tree. And I'm teasing a little bit, but all the other family members do have Apple. So are you an Apple guy or an Android guy? Well, my favorite phone was the Nokia. Oh, and uh, and I was so sad when we lost that. And mm. uh, uh, I, I like the technical abilities of that stuff. There's a lot of things I could do with that. And I had the freedom as somebody who knew computers to go in and, uh, you know, manipulate yeah. things and stuff like that. <laughs> and, uh, That's great. And then I went to a Windows phone after that, and uh, which didn't last very long. And that was nice. Mm. And then I went to an Android and... Uh, and eventually I went to uh, an iPhone. Only Break my heart. Of Break my heart, Father. And, uh, I'm kidding. I'm teasing. No, I'm, I'm with you, Father. <laughs> All right. So, so tell us again. This is fascinating. For, from those who are listening, uh, Faith, obviously, not. we've met a number of really uh, prominent uh, technical Silicon Valley-minded people who came to Faith at the other end of this, of inquiry. But you're, you're really speaking, perhaps, right now to those who have ambition. They've got gifts. They've got talents. They're making money. You know, I think it was fascinating working in this bank. I became an officer, very prestigious and stuff. And they told me that I would be a vice president in uh, two years, the way I was going. And uh, and then this woman left me two, two months before the wedding. <laughs> and we were planning to go to Boston because of uh, it, it was a technical center. And um, she was a software engineer also. Mm-hmm. And uh, so we thought Boston would be one of the best places to go and uh, to raise a family and uh, to continue our careers. And one of us would work from home and the other one would work and get the uh, uh, the benefits, insurance and everything else from working in the company. So uh, uh, and then maybe start our own company. And uh, OK, I just want to hug you. Know. you. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. She left. That's so sad. She said she, she, she said just she just wants to hug you. <laughs> No, no, I, I, I don't know why. And uh, I probably could figure out why. It was probably me. but uh, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, now, she just left and that was it. Gone. Mm-hmm. Bye. To just back up a couple of years, that's when I returned to the church. So you weren't going you to know, Mass. I, I was going to ask you, you weren't partaking of the sacraments up to that point. You fell away. Well, when... When it meant something to me, yes, you know, mm-hmm. when we're in the war zone on, on the ship, I, I, I would go to mass. I met the chaplain. I knew him and stuff like that. And, uh, uh, and then when I was in college, it was a Catholic college. And then, you know, there were times where I, periods where I would return. And uh, but then uh, inevitably I would fall off in my mind. The Catholic Church was still my father's, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. powerful right. and, and sad. We had to do it. I mean, it was part of the dictatorship uh, in the sense that, uh, you know, you guys better get up, get dressed, get to mass, and then we come home and then the fighting would start. There was a period there where I just, I mean, that's why I just blew it off. I mean, it just right. wasn't making any sense. Right. But I, I don't think I ever left God. You know, he was always there. I remember when my father first started working days, if I was home, he would come in and he would just 
smack me mm. behind the head. I'd be doing my homework uh, mm. out in the dining room and stuff like that. And mm. uh, and then it would start in and, uh, you know, the, the, the beating. And uh, we lived on the first floor. I would run out to an alley. Mm. I would, I'd make a left turn on the street. I'd go all the way end, to the end where they were building one of the new expressways. And it was just very peaceful there and very open. And uh, I don't know how many times I just cried out to God, why, mm. why, why, why? And uh, about seven times I had this feeling that I was being enveloped with love, mm. just wrapped mm. right there on the streets. Mm. I knew it was God. He never answered any of my questions. And... I always walked away with uh, uh, a heart full of peace and uh, with the idea that that someday it's going to be over. You are listening to a very special episode of IgniteRadioLive.com. We encourage you to really receive all the graces being poured out this summer in your marriage and family, but begin to anticipate a great family adventure beginning in September. We're calling it Supreme Makeover Home Edition. Eight weeks of talking and praying in your home with phenomenal gathered monthly events leading into November 3rd and 4th, Sanctus Eucharistic Family Revival, led by the Franciscan Friars of the Renewal. That's right, the Franciscan Friars of Renewal. They're amazing. They're going to be coming and leading this tremendous family and marriage event on November 3rd and 4th. We want to give you a ground floor opportunity to get on board. You can do that at catholicrevival.us. And now back to our program. You know, I spent a lot of time searching for God. I mean, I would even go into Central Park on on Sundays, back in the roller skating days. And uh, uh, I played roller hockey and stuff, but uh, uh, I love to roller skate. And I would uh, skate all the way to Central Park from Queens, right over the 59th Street Bridge and everything like that. And the street preachers and everything else would be there. And uh, I'd let them pray over me. You know, I'd listen to what they had to say. The last person that, I, I mean, I followed Moonies and they followed me. Um, <laughs> Jehovah Witnesses, Jewish, it didn't matter. And uh, I was just looking and I thought maybe I would fit in someplace. My sweet was, Lord. You got that whole, uh, <laughs> right, little Beatles era, Jesus Revolution going on, yeah. Keith Green, John Michael Talbot. Yep. None of our motivations are absolutely pure. This one day I was there, and there was this beautiful Seventh-day Adventist, and I just had to go over and listen to her. Yeah, and, uh, <laughs> of course you did. <laughs> <laughs> I got the conversation with her afterwards, and uh, she said, oh, you're Catholic. She said, I bet you, you'd love to go to Mass again. It's been a long time. And I said, yeah. I said, but, I mean, you guys got Mass? And she said, oh, yeah, yeah, we have Mass. Saturdays on uh, uh, so I said uh, okay so they had this little little chapel they built over the storefronts on Columbus Avenue in, in uh, Upper Manhattan and uh, so I went there went upstairs and I was the first one there and she was in the back doing something and uh, I saw orange juice and crackers on the altar <laughs> and I'm, I, I said what's with the crackers and the <laughs> orange juice and she said, well, that's what we're going to use this week. I said, what do you mean, use this week? She says, well, we use different things every week, you know. And uh, and it was amazing, the, the the reaction. I said, you people are crazy. <laughs> you knew. And I could, I, I, I could still feel the anger welling mm. up. And I, I stormed out of there. And... Uh, and as I'm leaving, I'm saying, even the Catholics got it right. And, uh, <laughs> That's great. And as I'm going down the stairs, I'm saying, wow, if they got it right, I'm in trouble. I mean, yeah, they bread and wine. I mean, this is what changes into the body and blood of Christ. And I mean, if I'm not part of this, I am in trouble. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, and that's when I made it my decision to at least come back to the church on a trial basis. Mm -hmm. I thought I thought I could prove them wrong on a lot of things. And uh, uh, 
it didn't work. And, uh, <laughs> so if I could um, pause you, you took us back a little bit and filled out some of your encounter experience in the tumult of your home, experiencing God and experiencing his arms and just kind of indescript, if you will, but a sense of his presence, very beautiful. And then you, you traced a little bit, I assume, up to maybe more of the, the your 30s, where you're experiencing a lot of the Jesus movement and you're open to things and you're asking questions maybe, the Seventh-day Adventist, beautiful young lady, of course, and and seeing a little bit of a counterfeit, if you will, them trying to maybe reach you in a form that they thought Catholics would be con- connected with, but something deep within you of John 6, this is my body, this is my blood, was was woven into you and was an occasion for you. So I'm presuming that that's up in your 30s now where you're still in the banking or Wall Street, you know, <coughs> successful business world. Is it, Does that coincide? Is that when this sort of Catholic Eucharistic reawakening is happening? Right, and I, I, I actually returned when I was 27, and I was still working down on, on Wall Street, and uh, uh, which was nice because uh, I had uh, Our Lady of Victory's Church right mm. right around the corner, mm. and uh, uh, and that's where I started going to mass, and uh, oh, and I was filled with questions and um, amazing, and uh, I remember I was talking. There's this one priest who used to parade around in his his cassock and the Monsignor. I thought he was the pastor, so I said, "Hey, Father, I, I, could I spend some time? I, I got some questions, and uh, at last about two weeks." And he said, "Oh, you better go and see this priest." And I said, "Okay," and then uh, and then he pushed me off to somebody else, but uh, <laughs> and that was Father. J- uh, James Halligan and mm. what a blessing that, mm. that, that happened. And, uh, uh, I called and made an appointment. I went in, we talked, well, I talked for 45 minutes. Mm. And, uh, at the end of that, he took out his book and he said, I, I, I'll see you in about two weeks. Right. And I said, well, this guy's got some nerve. I didn't even <laughs> say one to come back. I Good businessman, huh? <laughs> He's making yeah, a sale. And, uh, uh, he became my confessor and spiritual director for 30 years, and wow. uh, my best friend. He was he was absolutely amazing, and not just with me. He was spiritual director for the Sisters of Life, mm-hmm. for uh, uh, Mother Teresa's sisters. He must have converted uh, a good part of Wall Street. I mean, the number of people wow. that used to come to see him. Uh, was amazing. Well, so 1970s, right. roughly, if I have my math, it takes us to 72, 73, 74, roughly. I assume Father Benedict Grishel is roving about there in the somewhere in some respect around that time. And you and I connected a little bit about that. Of course, I encountered him more in the 90s. I'm blessed to live with him at Trinity Retreat at Larchmont, New York, which was eventually became the Archdiocesan um, Spiritual Center. A guy named Father Gene Fulton was managing it. Yeah. Um, so Not very. Long. Very dear friend, of course, Joe Campo got me introduced to uh, Youth 2000. This is before he was doing the making the movies and all of that. And I brought Mount 2000, that that burning bush, powerful Youth 2000 experience to Mount St. Mary's in Emmitsburg, where I was a seminarian for a number of years. So just our, our paths are somewhat weaving me a little bit younger, slightly younger than you. But um, OK, so continue this story. You have the spiritual director. You're on Wall Street. You're making money. Take us up to considering the priesthood. A couple of things happened, and uh, that, that that first uh, love of my life, when she came back in. Uh, you know, uh, uh, I introduced her to Father Halligan, and uh, he worked out her uh, uh, her marriage and everything else. And mm. uh, uh, so we're still friends today, which is oh. a, a beautiful thing. And uh, and then this other woman left two months before the wedding, and. Uh, and so I took a major cut in pay to go up and get into engineering up in Boston. Mm. And uh, one of the best things about that is when I moved to Boston, uh, I was right around the corner from the Oblates of the Virgin Mary mm. and uh, their seminary, Our Lady of Grace Seminary. Mm. And Father Tim Gallagher, you must know him, and the Discernment of Spirits mm-hmm. and all that. So uh, Amazing. Uh, Amazing. When I came back to the church in New York, uh, I found myself uh, in the Legion of Mary and uh, doing all kinds of evangelization work. And uh, uh, and we used to use the Knights of Columbus booklets Mm -hmm. and uh, with with our evangelization, we'd be down the Staten Island Ferry evangelizing and, uh, you know, answering questions in my three-piece suit and everything like that. That continued when I went to Boston. I started a group with college students and I started uh, a group of seminarians also at the same Mm -hmm. time. 
I was probably involved maybe at least 20 hours in the church uh, at that time, mm -hmm. doing different kinds of works and involved in, in the life of, of, of the seminary there. I was, I was one of them in, in, in many, many ways. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'd eat meals there on Sundays and sometimes during the week. And uh, I would go to 645 Mass in the morning, and then they would start adoration after that. And I would take the first hour mm -hmm. so that all of them can go to uh, eat together and uh, – I was known as a professional, rubbing elbows with many other professionals at that time from different places, especially the universities and stuff. Mm. Some of the uh, uh, some of the deans and provosts and all that stuff. But I loved living in Boston. Oh, mm. it was fantastic! And uh, uh, I was right down uh, across from the public gardens, right around the mm. corner from Cheers. We would play pinochle over in my apartment. With uh, the old lace would come down, and uh, we'd have beer and popcorn. So I, I would buy specialty beers. Uh, All right. For, for most of us, except for Brother Lou, he wanted Strohs. Oh, <laughs> fellow beer snob, I love you, Father. What a what a blessed time! How the Lord used mm. Boston and and giving you an experience of family through the church, right? And just drawing you ever more deeply in. And I'm also thinking about any number of people who may be listening and using their extraordinary skills that they've acquired to feel, you know, needed and validated and making good money and decisions. And, you know, maybe they're in their 30s, 20s or 30s. And uh, so I'm really curious. And with the balance of our time, you know, what was it that spoke to you? I was still looking to get married. I was still dating. And, uh, uh, and uh, I would be now <laughs> still trying to get married if, uh, right. if I'm Houston, so. <laughs> and uh, but Mary was there. your main woman, and you just didn't know. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yes. I was dating this woman up there, she had two children, and I asked her to marry me. Something went wrong from that point on, and uh, mm. I won't go into the whole thing. Very, very difficult. Mm. I mean, especially for these kids, they never. I was the, the the closest thing they ever had to a father, mm. and uh, at, at the same time, the company I was working, I really got sabotaged, and uh, mm. there's a lot of jealousy that goes on. My project was always on time, and I had a faithful bunch of uh, engineers working for me, uh, and I found out that he was stealing them to come in on weekends and work on some of the other projects, mm. and uh, you know, mm. I stood up against him. And then he went to the director. He wanted me to quit one day, and I, mm. I said, well, he's going to have to tell me to my face. I said, is this true? You want me to leave? And he said, no, no. Mm. You know, this other guy told him. He really uh, slammed me, and uh, so he said, well, you know what? Take some time off. He said, when I come back, he said, I have a new project. I'm going to put you in charge. He said, he'll be working for you. And I'm saying, oh, no, that's yeah. not going to happen. Uh, <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> yeah. I'll and pass. so I wound up leaving there. And uh, uh, But before I did, I thought about the priesthood. I, I just chickened out. And then uh, I left there and I, I went to a startup company uh, working with Unix. I don't know if you know mm -hmm. the operating system, but uh, I was able to... Uh, support it onto two brand new chips that uh, were being developed by Motorola. Very, it's very, very consequential. Yeah. Yeah. When I came in and took that job, this kid, he wanted it. Mm -hmm. And he seized the opportunity because he was a friend of the, uh, of the vice presidents mm -hmm. to, to mm -hmm. take it. And, uh, I made my case, but then the next day I came in and he said, "You're off the project," and uh, wow. uh, it was it was really devastating yeah. and uh, um, heartbreaking. Yeah, I mean, I put my resume out right away, and I had a lot of uh, incredible offers from presidents of companies, computer corporations, and uh, this one guy kept calling me and he said, I am not going to interview another person until you either tell me yes or no, you're going to take the job. I had a bachelor's in computer science. Many other people had a lot more. Mm. But he said, you're the guy I want. He said, because you've come in and you've mm. built things and, mm. uh, uh, you know, you've designed systems and all that stuff. And, uh, and deep down, I had to be honest with myself. And that was, uh, I thought, once again, this was an opportunity to... Mm. try the priesthood and mm. uh i was 38 years old i figured my life was half over the st statistically <laughs> and um uh, i was a member of opus day during that time mm. and it was different from any other place in the country right. 
we used to for meals and stuff. We used to have our meditations. We had Father Sal, who was an incredible priest and evangelizer, and uh, uh, but we'd go out to Harvard Square for beers and stuff like that. And they were really down to earth. Mm-hmm. Had a lot of firemen, policemen, and you know, not just intellectuals. And uh, mm-hmm. you could rub, rub elbows with a lot of people. And um, and the chairman of the board was a Opus Day member, mm-hmm. and uh, he was the one who pumped the first two and a half million dollars into our company. He would invite all the CFOs and the CEOs uh, throughout the greater Boston area and uh, down to Harvard Square on the 38th floor of the Charmet Bank building. And he would have breakfast for them. And uh, mm. and then he would have a priest come in and give them a talk. Wow. I mean, absolutely amazing. Brilliant. And yes. uh, I was... Uh, I was the one who was the only one there who was not a CEO or CFO, but uh, I was invited. <laughs> but I got to know him, and uh, um, and I said, Jim, I said, you probably know what's going on. Mm-hmm. And uh, he said, yeah, he said, he said, you know, there's a conflict of interest, so be careful what you say. And I, I said, no, I'm, I'm just thinking that this might be an opportunity for me to look into the priesthood. And... Uh, you know, knowing him, mm-hmm. and uh, that's a good Catholic, eight children and all that stuff. And uh, uh, I said, could you just do me a favor, keep me on the payroll uh, until the end of January? This was just before Christmas. And uh, I want to get down to New York and visit my spiritual director, spend a week or more with him and see, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. how this thing turns out. And he uh, said, um, yeah, sure, definitely. I went down. It was a uh, a powerful time there, you know, mm. me and Father mm. Alvin. Everybody, my friends up in Boston, the Oblates, other priests I knew, they said, look, you know what? If you're going to go into a seminary, they're not going to take you till September. This is December. I mean, you don't have to wait a year. The rector wanted to speak to me, and uh, I told him what was going on. And he said, you're with Father Halligan? I, I said, yeah. And uh, all these years, I said, Yeah. He said, can you come on February 2nd? (laughs) And I remember going right up to Father Halligan's room and I'm saying, Father, I mean, this is not supposed to happen. I mean, uh, you know, I'm supposed to take some time off, get a contract, build a nest egg and all that stuff. And, And here, they want me to come right away. I haven't taken my psychologicals. I can't take them till March. They're probably going to find out I'm crazy and, and, <laughs> and I'm going to lose everything. So uh, he said these words, he's no fool who gives up all that he cannot keep for that which he cannot lose. Mm. Mm. Say that again. What? Say that again. That, that, that's what I said to him. I said, Father, <laughs> say that real slowly. He's no fool who gives up all that he cannot keep for that which he cannot lose. Mm. If you search that, it's a quote from a Protestant missionary. And uh, I said, wait a minute, all that I cannot keep, you're talking about the nest egg. And he said, yeah. And I said, you're telling me this is somehow connected with my salvation? He said, yeah. (laughs) And I said, and and what if they throw me out? He said, well, you know, uh, that's (laughs) well, so be it. Yeah. (laughs) Wow. So I joined. Yeah. And uh, I went back to Boston. I had my Legion of Mary group there, and I was telling them. And uh, I I needed some help because I I needed somebody to take over my apartment. One of the women there, she was looking looking for an apartment. I said, uh, take the whole thing over. She said, I need furniture. I said, no. I said, whatever doesn't fit in the car is Mm. yours. Amazing beautiful, Mm -hmm. and I'm sure in your mind it's just scratching the surface of the story, and I do hope that you take time to write the book. If you had three minutes of a captive audience, three minutes of a captive audience with the world, and think of those who are parishioners, what are the most important things that you are called to say to them and us at this moment in history from your years of life, and particularly as priesthood? Well, first of all, I think that, I mean, when we look out at the world, I don't think very many of us are happy with it. I I see the church as the only thing that can change the world. Mm. And it was meant to change the world. We've got to get away from this idea that 
religion is a private affair and we have to start living it. We need to be able to uh, find ourselves in the midst of all these people and, and show them what the Catholic faith really is, what the Catholic Church really is. Evangelization is not what we, we think it is. When I was in St. John's University in my third year, I thought I would study psychology. <laughs> like Father Groeschel he said, he said he started psychology just to figure out himself and his problems. So, <laughs> so I thought I would do the same. And I'm sitting in a class on the first day, and this priest walks in, Father Ed Smith. He's from Bushwick, Brooklyn, one of the worst neighborhoods in the world. And he starts talking about what this introduction to psychology is going to be. And he starts talking about all this abnormal behavior and stuff. And uh, I'm feeling very uncomfortable because some of this is touching me. And... Uh, mm. I'm, I'm thinking they're all looking at me in the room because they can they can <laughs> they can see that. That's uh, so. Afterwards, he, uh, he he was on the front of the room, and when everybody left the room, I said, "Father, we got to talk." He said, "Oh, we got the whole semester." I said, "No, no, we got to talk." I said because this stuff really uh, touched me. After seven weeks talking about my father, he asked me a question. I don't know what it was, and I came out on a rant, and he said, "You're blaming." I said, of course I'm blaming. Hmm. And uh, no, he said, you don't understand what blaming is. He said, blaming is the past. Hmm. And this is the now, this is the future. He said, I understand your father is to blame for so many things. But he said, if you come back here next week and your life isn't any better, hmm. you have nobody to blame but yourself. Hmm. Hmm. Powerful. He blew me away. Yeah. Yeah. He took away all my excuses. In that one sentence, mm -hmm. I mean, I'll never forget it. Mm -hmm. And then I came back the next week. In these number of weeks, he said, you've told me all the things you really wanted your father to do for you. You know, all the things you wanted him to be for you. You know, and then there were all the things he was supposed to do for you. He was supposed to be the one, not just your, to send you to Catholic school, but the formation and all of that. You know, the, the relationship. He said, what I want you to do, starting today, when you leave here, he said, all those things your father never did for you, all the things he wanted, um, <clears throat> you wanted him to do for you, he said, I want you to do them for others. Mm. Wow. He said, love responds to love. Mm. And he said, this is not going to make up probably for any of the love that you lost during your childhood. And even if you had that now, it probably didn't matter, wouldn't matter, because, you know, you need something else now. But he said, love responds to love. And if this is the way you live, he said, you will be loved. Mm -hmm. And that's been my approach to life mm -hmm. from that day. So I just need to ask, just to fill it out a little bit, maybe it's more of the female question, but what was ordination day like for you? Uh, my father was in the hospital for the second time, and uh, I had confronted him, and I told him, I said, he wouldn't see me again. I tried to reconcile with mm -hmm. him once. We did, and uh, he called me, and uh, we were supposed to visit him that day, my mother, my sister, and I in the hospital. And uh, and so after the ordination, we had a little ceremony, d uh, dinner. We went over to Pennsylvania where he was. And he actually asked me if I would say mass for all the people who uh, took care of him during that time. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, and so I had a mass kit with me. So I went in. My mother was sitting next to him, and she said, Frankie. Dennis is here. He's a priest. Mm. You know, I, you could hear the death rattle mm -hmm. beginning. And uh, I told them, I said, Dad, I'm going to anoint you. And uh, mm. everybody says the last rites. He couldn't speak. And so I said, Dad, be sorry for all the sins of your past life. And 
Mm. I gave him absolution and I anointed him. And then my mom said, say ma, say ma. So we got the, the, the bed table there and uh, I started to say mass and uh, he died during the consecration. Oh my wow. goodness. Praise Jesus. What a beautiful ordination day. Wow. wow. Are you kidding me? What a gift. And then, um, and it, w- it was kind of amazing that God had this all arranged. And yes. uh, uh, there was a chapel in the hospital, and I went downstairs, and I was just crying my mm. eyes out. And uh, and it was amazing that God chose me right then mm. to set my father straight so that he could stand Mm. before Christ in his judgment. I said, if he can stand before God sin-free, then I can't hold on to anything. Mm. Mm. Wow. Amen. From the past. And it just seemed to all, it just seemed to drop away from everything. It just fell like scales, everything. Wow, that is so uh, good. It rang throughout the whole diocese. I have, uh, I have a recording of uh, Cardinal O'Connor on that. He called my seminary pastor where I was going to say my first Mass. I love Cardinal O'Connor. Mm. Yes. Oh, yeah. He used to call me Big D. Oh, <laughs> I can hear him. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Big D. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, and that prepared me. Mm. That day prepared me for dealing with the, the dying. And I've had so many experiences like that. Absolutely fantastic. They can't speak nothing. And, and I mean, God's mercy is just thrown on them in the last moments of their lives. You know, not only do they have peace, but the whole, the whole family, the whole room is filled with peace because of, uh, of God's mercy. And, but how uh, beautiful to come full circle again from those roots of, of a broken home all the way through God's guidance to the point of deep reconciliation in the context of a holy priesthood. I just want to say in the name of Jesus and the Holy Spirit, Lord, help us to receive, to see and to receive, to see and to receive your transforming grace, your light in our lives, to forgive, to apologize, to receive the newness of grace and newness of life in this holy communion. What you just said just kind of... Uh reminds me of what Pope Benedict uh, the 16th said that uh, you know this uh, this this grace this transforming grace we need he said the whole church needs the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit yes. and then so he's not misinterpreted he said and that is that the grace of our baptism and confirmation come alive Amen. and uh, you know stir it into flame and uh, i think that's what we need to do father dennis thank you so much and god bless you and your priesthood and gosh just abundantly abundantly we are so grateful very deeply grateful that all of you have been on this journey with us ignite radio live you can find out other great programs at ignite radio live.com we do encourage you to make the commitment to put that flag in the sand, parents, to encounter the grace God wants to pour into our lives. And this gathering guide is a great way to do it. No, by the way, it's going to be a challenge. The enemy doesn't want that to happen. The world and just all the, the, the things that compete for our affections, you know, are going to make it very difficult to say, no, this week we're going to find meaningful time to talk and pray. And we make that very easy with this Live It Gathering Guide. You can find it at ilovemyfamily.us. And join us in a marking a beginning hopefully of a great season of tremendous renewal with many other families in September leading up to this Sanctus Eucharistic Family Revival so check that out at catholicrevival.us god bless you until next time